And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Robert Lindsay Milne, who is recognized across North America as one of the most insightful, psychic, intuitive counselors of his time. Robert has traveled the world giving insight with his psychic intuitive sessions to tens of thousands of people and has also worked with the police and Canadian Secret Service helping to gather intel and work on missing persons cases. Today we're going to talk about some of his life experiences as well as get his predictions for 2023. Robert, welcome back and thanks for joining me. I, I've really been looking forward to um, talking with you again. We we had such a nice talk last year. Mm, it's great to have you back. It's like seeing an old friend. Yeah. Your way of interviewing is is um, very subtle and and um, it's, certainly on on uh, for me is you were quite calming as well. There was a, there was a a sense of of acceptance. Mm-hmm. Well, and that felt really good. That's great. How do you make a psychic link with somebody? Ooh, wow. Well, we, we, we just don't start off at the, with the little ones, eh? Just to... We jump right into the fire. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> How do you make a psychic link with someone? The way I do it mm-hmm. is I simply think about that person and then sense their energy. Here's how I did it with Tom. Uh, um, you know, I was involved with the guy that that um, w- was dying with a, the most potent super uh, bug on the planet, um, and he had infected it and it was one hundred percent antibiotic resistant. And he he was sick and in a coma. And when I started working on this, um, I had already known Tom. And I had done readings for Tom a few times in the past. And all the readings that I had done for Tom were were, uh, online or uh, video. In fact, I've only seen Tom in person once. And but yet I've I've known him for 15, 17 years or or, or something. And um, I also knew know his wife. She came to me for a reading. Um, She had just finished her PhD in epidemiology. She came to me for a reading uh, um, about 30 years ago, and she's been in contact with me. So they were clients. I had given Tom a warning a couple of years before. And Tom was, Tom is a, um, a real kind of macho guy actually you know he's like six foot five um he's he um is a professor of um ex- uh, experimental psychology and uh, has a phd in psychiatry and uh, he's at the university of california he's also associate dean and stephanie has a phd in epidemiology she she is a uh, um uh, uh, a professor, ha- and she is associate dean of the epidemiology department, and she is a renowned researcher um, specializing in 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 AIDS. Tom, I thought of Tom as a as a um, an old uh, Indiana Jones kind of guy. And and in his early days, he he was a researcher in the fields and in, in, in South America, and he got kidnapped by the Sandinistas and and just about starved to death. And um, and and he'd had many experiences like that, being you know doing the type of work that he did. In his later years, he had ballooned up to a really heavy weight, like over three hundred pounds, and. The year, uh, I, the year before, uh, or two years before, um, he caught the superbug. I had done a reading for him, and I, when I do readings, um, and when I have to give bad news, 
and you have to give bad news. Um, and that, and that, by the way, a whole new conversation, but, mm. but if you, because if you can see it, you can change it. And that's, and, and, and um, if, and, and you're, so you're obligated if you're seeing it to give that person the information so they can do something about it. So the techniques that I've developed over my, my lifetime, um, when I'm giving bad news, I, before I do that, I look forward into the future and I describe to them the positive result of the negative situation that I'm going to be telling them about. But I don't tell them about the negative stuff. I tell them about the positive result. And then I talk about something different. And then I go back and talk a little bit more about the positive thing. And then just, just like a little drop of water in, 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 in a basin, you know, I'll drop just a little hint. And then change the subject and then give more other information. And then, and then talk about the positive thing, then come back. And then, and then, and in some cases, I'll take a half an hour to, to get to the point where I'm giving that them that information. And most of the time, they already have it. They already have figured it out. And most of the time, they're not panicked. So with Tom, I said to him, you know, in, in two years from now, or three years from now, I can't remember that number, um, you're going to lose more than 100 pounds. And then I started talking about other stuff. And then I went back to, you know, you're, you know, in two years from now, or you're, you're not going to be wearing the clothes that you wear because the clothes will be too big. And then, and then um, I said, however, um, th there is something that might be affecting your stomach. Um, and I changed the subject and talked about other things. And then I went to the 100 pound loss. And then and then um, it took me about 20 minutes. And, and I eventually brought up that there was a real problem in his stomach and, and, and he needed to he needed to do something about it. And I said, you will get you will become as sick as you possibly can be and not die. And you're going to lose more than 100 pounds. And I said to him, I'm thinking it's up to you and your decision. You, you can either um, listen to what I said and, and scare you and, and you take care of yourself or you ignore that, get as sick as you possibly can be uh, without dying, and live and l lose more than 100 pounds. So I guess you're saying that the person is able to change their future. Absolutely. And then I said to him, it's up to you. You can do it the easy way or you can do it the hard way. Does it take an emotional toll on you giving people bad news? Yes, it does. Um, one of the reasons, when, when over my career, um, I've been involved with um, lost people. And if I would have spent the time um, as a psychic to really develop that, um, I, I, I would have been really, really good. But I, um, most of the time in those cases, um, the people are dead uh, or the child's dead or... Um, I just don't have I I just don't have what it takes to tell somebody their child's dead or or their wife's dead or 
I, I just don't have that. And, and um, so I, I've kept it a, a secret. Anytime I ever get involved with, with something like that, um, they come to me. I would never go to them. Actually, I never do that to, even for people that come to for readings. If somebody wants to have a reading, they have to come to me. Um, I, I, I don't reach out like that. Um, and, And sometimes I can't say no. Whether, whether it is um, that I, uh, um, I just sometimes just can't say no, and sometimes I don't know why. What I do, though, is I get the guarantee I, that I'll get involved on the condition that nobody knows the psychic's been involved. Um, I, I, I just, and, and, and so I, I, I certainly, and it's because I don't want a lot of publicity there. And I've, I've experienced that. Are your psychic experiences happening to you spontaneously, or is that something that you control? It's like having, um, a sense, uh, an energy, and and it's on, um, and and there's a, a a dial like on a radio, and and it has different volumes, so so I can turn the volume down, uh, but I'm always um, aware. I'm I'm always um, sensing around me, and and often you know, seeing people injured or in trouble. Um, and, and, and I sense, you know, so things like that. Uh, the, the answer to the question is, um, I don't know. It's I've done so much. I've, I've, I've spent so many years and, you know, hours and, um, being in that state of mind. I, I'm not sure if there's, if it's, if, if it's, not my total state of mind now. Do you ever find yourself like at a grocery store and you're just picking up something from the guy in front of you in line and you are trying to determine, should I tell this guy something or stay silent? Well, first of all, if, if I did something like that, um, that would be me going to the person. I could, I could get punched to the face for that. Um, so. Even if I was right. So the other thing is, it's not my business. Do you think that everybody is psychic to some extent? I think that, you know, being psychic is a, um, a natural phenomenon that most mammals have. And, and being psychic, and if you think of um, psychic, the word psychic uh, comes from a Greek root, psyche, mind, soul, or self. And, and if you have one of those or, and you use it, th then you're psychic. So just being a mammal, you have that sense of awareness. It's what caused us to survive. It what, it's what caused us to get out of the caves. Um, it caused us to have the type of society that we have today. Mammals uh, um, are pack animals too. So most animals or most humans um, have a sense, an intuition. Um, have you ever been somewhere and you look up and someone's looking at you. And, and it's not intimidating, you just notice. Um, well, well that's, that, that's people sensing each other's energy. And most people can do that. Um, then some can do it more. Being psychic is a natural phenomenon that, that we have, is, and, and, it's, and it's, for, it, it's survival. And almost everyone has it. Think of a bell-shaped curve. At one end of the spectrum, there there is somebody with absolute zero awareness, and then at the far end of the bell-shaped curve, there's someone that has a hundred percent. 
I wouldn't want to be either one of those guys. Uh, I would, it would be a nightmare being at a hundred percent. You just couldn't function, you know, you just, you'd have to live in a, you know, soundproof room or something. Um, or a lead room so not, not, no other energy could get in. Wow, that'd be a nightmare. Um, so most people have that sense of being uh, aware. And that's the base root. And what I tell my, my students, and I think last year I was talking about this, and um, I said I used to teach this, this psychic class. Uh, well, this year I'm teaching a psychic class too. Um, but uh, um, what I tell people is become aware of what's obvious. Look at whatever, look at the person. Look at, just look at them. Become aware of what's obvious about them. When you become aware of what's obvious, then more becomes obvious about them. You see more. Um, and when I see that in, in, in terms of I, I, I see more, I really seldom have a sense of, of um, opinion. Um, and, and then when I see what's obvious, then more becomes obvious after that. And it just expands and then becomes more obvious. And then you get to a point in that moment of your awareness, what's obvious to you is not obvious to the people around you. And that's the very first steps of being in tune or, or being psychic. Is that, that's the very first thing. And what I get people to do is become aware of what's obvious and tell them. Say it. And and now now don't put your fortune teller sign up and then somebody come in and you give it the first, you know, you do that the first couple of shots, you know, it, that isn't gonna work. Um, but with friends, um, you know, talk about what's obvious and then say it to them. Other things to learn about what's obvious, it just, just came to my mind. Um <clears throat> Get some old photos, um, the real photo ones, not, not the ones that you would see in magazines. So family pictures or other, you know, just, just old pictures. Um, look at the people in the picture. Just look, just look at them. Look at their face. Look, look at how they're standing. Look at how they're standing with each other. Uh, look at what their eyes look like. Look, look just, just look at them. And then, and then say, this person seems like. Now, in a class, I would get people to be doing that. And the other person is going to be very open and say, you know, yeah, that kind of feels right. And the rule in the class is never say no. Because when you're giving creative information, um, whether it be uh, um, improv comedy, and the rule in improv com comedy is never say no. If somebody throws you something, never make a negative response because it blows the energy up. And when people are first learning uh, to, to become aware of what's obvious, they're not clear in how to, how to say it, but they're right in how they're seeing it. So we always encourage um, to give positive feedback. And then the more positive feedback, the more confident we become. And then we start naturally becoming aware of what's obvious. Are there any other fundamentals of being psychic that you can share with us? Yes. In... Um, I started touring as a, you know, as a psychic um, in in the mid nineteen seventies, and um, I was, <clears throat> excuse me, I went to a city, London, Ontario, 
um, it's it's big university city, and it's it it, it certainly is you know a, a city of, of of parks and gardens. Um, I was on CFPL, and it was a you know phone in show, and London is uh, right in the middle of the snow belt, and when I was there that that week, it was the biggest snowstorm they had in the last fifty years. So everything was shut down. Uh, everybody heard the radio, and then everybody wanted to come and have a reading from me. The guy came, this one guy came to me. I can't remember what he looks like, anything about him, except um, I remember he told me that he was a court stenographer. He retired. And I said to him, wow, how many words a minute can you write? And he said, I don't know. I said, how come? He said, I just write down what they say. Um, that was profound. So I realized that that, and I've noticed back in the days when when it was, you know, the early days, um, we didn't put labels on what we did. We just did it. And and we didn't say, well, it's this thing and how we do this thing, we do this and this and this. We just did it. We did what needed to be done with, with an open mind. Um, I, got, I called myself a psychic, just like that, for years and years and years. And then the new agers started to call me old fashioned and 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 I'm thinking, well, well, what else do I do? I, I I do my job. Um, and my job is giving people answers. That, that's what my job is. And unlike a math test, so a math test, you just give the teacher or the professor the answer. <laughs> they say, uh-uh, no, you have to prove it. Well, um, you have to know how you got the answer. In my job, get the answer. And it doesn't matter how we get the answer. It doesn't matter if it's become aware of what's obvious. It doesn't matter if it's if it's being clairvoyant or clairsentient or and it doesn't matter give the answer. And so I don't focus on what a, a, a word. I just simply, I just, just simply do it. Um, I found out in the last couple of years, since I came out of semi-retirement, all the things that uh, I did naturally um, turn out to be put in labels and categories now. And, and I see all these people studying this uh, way of doing something and becoming an expert when mostly what you need to do is learn about becoming aware of what's obvious, becoming aware of understanding ways of saying to that person what's obvious, learning to expand your mind to, if today is Tuesday, this could happen so, and, and practice that. Um, usually when I, I, I teach a class, though, um, I'll, I'll say, um, you know, you have to practice every day, and, and you know, one person comes up and says, uh, ask a question, and I say, well, okay, do a couple of hundred readings and come on back and talk to me and we, we, we can sort that out. And they go, 200 readings? And I say, oh, yeah, I know. I've done 100,000. <laughs> <So, laughs> and, and the point of that is um, understand the basics and then improve upon them. But when you get messed up, go back to the basics again. Now, when you're talking about noticing the obvious, mm -hmm. to me, it means that you're 
first of all, just kind of reading their body language. Is their body language telling you a lot of information or is it helping you connect with them psychically? Both. Okay. I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to make a question, but, but, but you don't have to answer it. Um, people communicate on three levels and the three levels are um, unconscious Nonverbal communication, body language, tone of voice, and the words we use. Body language, unconscious communication consists of 75% of our communication. The way we say something consists of 20% the way we express ourselves, and the words we use are about 5%. So, becoming aware of that information would certainly help someone to understand um, what the person in front of them is experiencing, is going through, and to throw that information away uh, would be like wearing glasses and not wearing them. Well, why would you do that? It's just the same as, um, you know, a major part of my career, I did telephone. And being psychic is is we have you know five senses you know touch taste smell see here and and um when we take all of those senses and put put them together we get a sixth sense extrasensory perception so when we become aware of all those senses we then become more psychic and that and that's where it starts. Um, that's where um, so that that that's where that that's where it starts. Part of that you see something by a movement. You got to be pretty good to see the movement and understand the movement. And then that movement means something, and that leads you into. Um, the next level. I've never been asked that question before. I was putting all of that together as you were asking me, right? So, um, and and that and that's what happens. Um, and it's it's a fun exchange. And this is where sometimes I'm thinking about one thing and then thinking about something else at, at another time. And then sometimes I might be thinking about what I'm going to have for lunch too. <laughs> Well, I'm going to lead you in a different direction, and that is well, not. I have a prediction. All right. I predict you're going to ask me, do I have any predictions? Now, did you know that from my body language or what I said? No, no. Yeah, but we talked about before the show started. <laughs> All right. Well, what have you got for 2023? What are you seeing? You know, 2023 is... is um, going to be a very active year and in its active in this activity it's going to be extreme um there are going to be a lot of oh first of all as before we get going there is going to be a 2024 that's good news a 20 a, a, a 2050 see 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 this is this is what here's a demonstration of how I give bad news right okay it, it's not going to be so bad um so 2023 is is a year of extreme and and it's going to be quick and sudden extremes um North America certainly um and most around the world the climate as everybody knows is is going to be uh continuing to get more intense um we're going to be seeing um
this is really hard to say. I practiced even saying it. Um, there is a good chance that 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 some nuclear weapons are going to be um, uh, uh, shot off um, uh, um, uh, by the Russians. There's a bright side to that horrible situation. We're going to discover that the nuclear system is in the same shape as its army. Um, that could be in winter, um, our winter, it, it, it you know, could be in, in, into the summer. Um, that isn't a hundred percent, but, but, the guns are drawn. That's the heaviest thing I've ever said, John. I want to be wrong at this one. Um, so we're going to be going through, and it just depends on the part of the world that you're in, um, just about every part of the world is going to be saying they're they're not doing as well as what they did before the pandemic. Um, every part of the world is going to be consistently um, less than in the pandemic. This beginning of an interesting financial war go going to be going on. And that is, is that China, um, our side, our guys, whatever our guys are, um, are going to be using this opportunity where there's um, less purchasing and less um, manufacturing. Um, our guys and 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 um, America and 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 several other in our group. I'm, I'm Canadian, so we'll we'll be in it. Uh, we'll be taking that work. And, and and bringing it back home and and there's going to be some really big tensions going on with China as it's starting to lose its its financial strength that's going to be coming clear and as when by tax time in America that they're having some money problems um Two thousand and twenty-three is a year also of people. There are going to be rebellions. There are going to be uh, people fighting each other. Um, there are going to be less people fighting each other than people being good and 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 being positive with each other and for some reason i'm thinking I, i'm specifically talking about america um and for some reason i'm thinking that um 30 percent are the fighters 35 maybe and um uh <laughs> um 70 or 65 um are are the ones that are working together and 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 functioning mr biden um most likely will not um be the president in in 20 is the election in 2023 or 2024 uh, it's the elections in 2024 and then they whoever wins oh. takes office early 2025 okay mr biden um, President Biden um, is isn't going to run for um, president at, at that time. Um, Vice President Harris um, isn't going to be uh, running uh, for uh, uh, a president in that race. Um, there seems to be a younger person than than. Um, what 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 they have now 
um, while it would not be a landslide victory, it will be it will be substantial. Um, incidentally, by that time, the reason the dark side, as it were, I, I, that's not the right way to say it. Um, the reason the the, the fighters uh, um, are going to be down to thirty percent and less is that is that by the time of the election, uh, Mr. Trump will have been um, convicted on a couple of different um, uh, serious charges and and um, would be technically uh, under house arrest. Um, this this would be a battle that would go on for um, quite a long time. By a oh, I understand now. Uh, by about April, May, um, the um, uh, uh, hung not the, uh, not the Hungarians. Uh, help me, just the guys that the Russians are beating up. Oh, no, the Ukrainians. No. Yeah, yeah, the Ukrainians. Um, sorry, it was no. Who are the guys that are beating the Russians up? Uh, the Ukrainians. And and um, they 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 win that war. Um, they 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 win the war. Um, Mr. Putin certainly won't be around um, at that victory dance, um, and and um, have something to do with uh, uh, bleeding in the head. Maybe maybe some kind of. Um, uh, aneurysm or something causing it to plead a lot. In spite of the fact that if there's a possibility that the you know a, a nuclear weapon would be launched, um, it's unlikely it would be reciprocated. I guess what you're saying is it won't turn into World War Three. Absolutely. Thank you for saying that. Thank you for helping me with that. So um, now that's going to be concerning a lot of people. But on the other hand, the world is still going to be running and functioning, just not as easily or as comfortably as what it has been. So almost everybody um, will have trouble traveling. Almost everybody will have trouble with getting things. And I'm talking about us, you know, Canada, the United States. Now, it doesn't mean that we're in the midst of a famine. It just means that we don't have nearly the flexibility uh, that we used to have. And we'll be missing things, but we'll still be living well. Um, there are parts of the country that have little. And and they're going to have nothing, and and the divide is going to just in the next year is 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 going to be huge. Um, my immigration um, is 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 um, coming, and and is spreading out around the world. The good news about that is is. Already in place, there are groups um, that that um, there there are organizations or groups or governments that that are taking some kind of control and you know making it easier, more humane, something like that. I never thought I would make this. Uh, uh, I never ever thought that I would make this prediction, and and it just just came to me right now. And in over the next um, three or four years, there, <laughs> um, there there are uh, where where there is going to be a direct connection from um, a group 
of of of, of alien there's going to be an alien uh connection um intervention i can't believe i said that like i am that is so far out of my wheelhouse man that is just so far out wow huh. okay um so we're, there is what what happened is i was thinking how how, how does this get balanced that, that's where it came from okay um the next year um yeah so so ways the business are 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 changing and being different um and almost all of the pandemics that we've been experiencing um it's here in North America, we're pretty much at a neutral state in terms of growing or shrinking. And 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 that's going to be like with the flu and, and you know things like that. It's not going to grow, not going to shrink. Oh, okay, so um the flus and colds because of the pandemic um you know kind of look like they got lost they haven't uh, they'll go back to a, a balanced level pretty um pretty much like they were previous um but covid and those types of infections um pretty much like it is now a little bit higher a little bit lower that'll go on for about five years um oh well, i think that's something i uh, I think that's it. You've given us a lot of stuff. Thank you, Robert. I don't remember it. I, yeah, it just it just came in my mind. So you've been a psychic for over 50 years. 58 in January. How has the world of psychics changed over that time period? In my life, um, uh, it was illegal to do um psychic readings for for uh, it was against the law to do it and and um it, there was this you know hefty fine you could go to jail it was called the witchcraft act this was in in canada and it was instilled or written in in the late 1800s and uh and it and it didn't get a, get stricken from the the uh laws until uh july 1st 2019 and it, it stated that well this was all you know because church people uh you know the extreme christians in those days w wrote it you know anyone who fraudulently because if you do this you're a fraud anyone who fraudulently tells fortunes for a consideration uh section b anyone who um does healing or or um you know spiritual work um is it fraudulently and section c is is um accuse somebody using an occult or crafty science of a crime is punishable by one by uh, um five thousand dollars in no more than one year in jail and like like five grand in the 1800s was a lot of bread and right up until um um july 1st of 2019 it was it was it was in uh, uh the law why do you think it took so long to change it it was one of those laws that very seldom got used and very seldom got looked at it was um and i i didn't know anybody personally that actually got charged but there were a couple of times in my career where the police um, forced me to do something, um, or they wouldn't let me uh, do readings in the city. And they threatened that they would charge me. So they weren't they weren't like, you know, they 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 weren't making up laws or anything like that. I was I was breaking a law, and it was you know they were quite justified to stop me or arrest me. And they said they would if I didn't help them. And the way I have to tell you, um, <clears throat> once again, it was in the early days, and um, I had a Fiat X19. Uh, it was a uh, 1978 Fiat X19. So um, 
when I would go on tour, I didn't have a lot of money. Um, so Barrie, Ontario is about 70 miles north of Toronto, 75, 80. And I would go to Barrie for the first stop on my tour. And I would drive because it was d dollar for dollar. Um, it was the uh, um, best um a place that I went, it was like dollar for dollar. It didn't make the most huge amount, but the least, the most amount of, of, of energy came back for the least amount of energy I put out. And so I would drive up to Barry um, in, in the morning, check into a motel, then drive to the radio station, go on, answer calls for an hour or two hours. And then I say, listen, if you want to have a, a reading for me, I'm at the Bayshore in Collin. Then I drive like hell back to the to the you know the motel, answer the phone, book you know ten readings that day, and then ten the next. Jump uh, and only stay out there one night, and and um, all I had was my my food expenses, and then I had enough money to go to the next city, and and that's how I start my my tour. In that area, this one time. Um, there was a missing case. Um, she she uh, was a really upstanding young woman, mother, um, happily married, like they were, they really truly were, uh, and they had a beautiful baby, son, um, and both of them had careers, and she was a nurse, I think, and. Um, they would take their 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 children uh, at, go to the um, daycare at the church. This one day, um, the woman had a day off, and she decided she would get her hair cut at the mall. And she drove to the church, dropped the you know dropped her son off in the daycare, and then drove to the mall. And her car was parked right outside the, the hairdressers. The car got there and no one had ever seen her since. Just disappeared. And and um, it had gone on for a while. And I was um, up in, in um, Barrie it was a month or two later. Although I had known about it, it, it you know, it made the news in, in Toronto. And, but I didn't think about it very much. And the first night that I was there, um, partway through doing my readings, there's a knock on my hotel room door, or motel room door. I open the door and there are these two policemen, which, you know, I got, you know, kind of, you know, shook me up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And and um, they said that they wanted to talk with me about, you know, such and such. And, and I said, I don't do that. And they said, if you want to work in Barrie, you'll do that. And I said, OK, I will. But you have to come back when I finish my readings. And uh, well, I said 10 o'clock and they and they agreed and they came back at 10 o'clock and they, they you know, um, it was winter time and and um they came in their police car and and they took me in the police car down to the police station and and uh, um i was really nervous you know I, I i really wasn't quite sure what was happening and uh anyway we got into the station and and we were in this room and there was a bunch of maps and then they told me the story about this woman and some inside things and she said and they said w what can you do can you do you think you can find her or, or any information and um i'd never done that before i i i didn't do that i i just um i never thought about doing it so um uh, um, I, you know, I pulled some maps out or they pulled some maps out of the area and, um, I just put my hands over the map and, 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 and felt different areas. And then, and then I felt this one spot on the map and, and I said, you know, there's a used old train trestle there. 
Um, anyway, after that, I said, um, you're not going to find her until spring, but you'll find her at a location where there's a old train trestle that hasn't been used in a long time and 1910 we chiseled into it and they decided because i found it on the map they decided that they were gonna go looking for it that night and we were out driving all around and then the police chief came too right and and we were driving all around uh, um and and you know there were these three big cops and me and and um they they weren't that respectful well they were i was being forced and and um we're we're driving around and then they see the shadow and you know they stop back up and drive a little bit and and there's this train trestle it's in 1910 and then they took me really serious the next couple of days they had search parties but they couldn't find her and then and then um in late april of that year um one of the cops from barry phoned me and said they found her near there where was she i never asked i i didn't want to know i don't want to know oh i but i did make one deal with the with 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 the police is that is that the family must never know that a psychic was involved can you tell us a little bit about how you worked with the secret service Yes. Um, once again, it was it was it was um, in in the seventies, but I'm in my seventies, so um, it was the day that the new age was coming, and and I was the first Canadian psychic to um, uh, uh, appear and uh, and and tour Canada. I was the first, and to do call in, I was the first guy, um, and. Um, I and I even had my own radio show at that time at CJRN Radio in Niagara. It was a phone in psychic show. Um, I was auditioning for a talk show spot uh, in Ottawa. Now, in those days, there were no internets, there were no networks. If you're going to be on a radio show, your 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 body's in the studio, and so um, and the audition was how how do you do on the show? And I was I was flying to Ottawa, and um, and I and I uh, did the show and got the part, by the way, and and I I did that show every every uh, month for about. 10 years or something anyway so i get back home to toronto and we have to remember that that in those days telephones were on the wall um you know you had to dial your phone uh um there were 12 channels on tv and you know things like that um and it's not like it is today um a couple of days after i was in ottawa doing the show the program director called me and he said, um, this guy from TAS News Agency, uh, reporter, uh, but he's really a spy, um, wants to do an interview with you. And and I said, uh, I don't want to do that. Don't tell him. Don't give him my name. Don't give him my number. Nothing. Because we did, you know, we had telephone books then. Uh, okay, so... Um, you know, if you if you didn't have a telephone book for a city, and you you know, and you weren't in that city, you're in trouble. So um, I didn't want I didn't want to be involved. And and um, a couple of uh, maybe a week later, it's, no, this was a long time ago. So the, how far apart it was is questionable. It was a week or a day? I don't know. Um, all of a sudden, some of my friends were. We called me and said, Robert, I got a call from this guy. I got a call from this guy um, uh, from the RCMP security s service, and and there, he's asking questions about you. And uh, that happened for a while. And then one day I got a phone call, and this guy introduces himself, and he says, hello, um, this is um, Sergeant 
uh, from from the security service uh, at the RCMP. I'd I'd like to have um, a conversation, a, a, a non. I'd like to have a non criminal conversation with you in person. And I said, is that about the Russian guy? And he said, yes. And I said, I don't want anything to do with this. Um, I, 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 I just don't. And he said, would you please just talk with us? Because um, this could be something really important. And he said, you know, I don't know what exactly, but the implication was if you do this, you're doing a duty to your country, or you know, you know, whatever, whatever that our version of that shit was, right? Oh, sorry. I, I promised I wasn't gonna swear on your show. I'm sorry. That's all right. All right. Anyway, um, so anyway, um, he and his partner come to meet me, and 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 I had an office at a at a um uh, new age center group and 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 they came in and they were giants you know and like i'm like you know five six five you know five six and a half five seven maybe and these guys are like six foot three but they were wearing suits and they didn't even carry guns but they were they they were the canadian spies and they um started telling me about this guy and and um as they started to talk um, about this guy, um, I then said, he also has someone report, he would report to called Petrov. And these two guys looked at each other and they looked back at me and they said, there's no way you can have that information. And, and they weren't sure if it was psychic or i had inside information they they it was they um so we continued talking um and the guy that wanted to get in touch with me um was in fact um a reporter for tas news agency but he has diplomatic passport and he lives at the embassy and um, he had spent the biggest part of his career in Washington. And all of a sudden, from out of nowhere, he gets transferred to Ottawa. That's not a promotion. Um, and now everybody knew that he did, right? It wasn't like it was a secret, well, with these guys. And and they were always watched all the time, like they were followed. The, some of the you know, the embassy workers so um the mounty guys said that they believed that what he was doing was reaching out he might want to defect and they asked me would i see him and do a reading for him and um I said, sure, <laughs> you know, um, and and I said, how do we arrange it? And he said, um, next time you're going to do your show, um, when they start promoting it, um, he'll get the information from the, you know, the, the um, um, program director will give him your telephone number at the hotel that you're at. And he'll call you at home. And and he did. And on the day that we were going to this to do this, um, they met me at home and we went to a private part of the airport and, and then we flew on a on a government plane to Ottawa. It wasn't a big flight. Um and 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 I had to these two big guys beside me the whole time. And and then we were driven straight to the hotel. And, and went straight upstairs to my room. And it was like a normal room, but I found out later it was, it was very well bugged. But it had two adjoining rooms. And on both sides were, uh, you know, two or three guys in each room. And in and, and that room was was bugged as well. Remember, 70s technology, I guess. And then they then they 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 um told me about um 
told me about him. I was hesitating. I was since I say his name, uh, Yvonne is the first name. Uh, he, 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 um, they, they, they gave me, um, uh, they gave me a, a dossier and read the dossier about his life. And that's the first and only time when I do readings that I did a reading that I uh, got prepared like that. And then they said, he said, they said, now he, he's a pretty big guy. Um, and he said, they're more tactile than we are. And he said that he'll sit close with you. And 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 don't be frightened if he you know if he touches you. He said that's very much in their 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 culture, and he's not coming on to you. So just don't get worried. So I'm in the room, and you know he shows up right on time. Um, I'm I'm got all this information about him. He comes in, sits down, and I start to do his reading. And it took about five minutes to realize the information I had was wrong. And what they were concerned with, while they thought he was going to um, con uh, convert, uh, 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 defect. defect, yes, thank you, defect, um, is because it was during the Brezhnev era when Brezhnev was losing power and he was he was protected by Brezhnev. And they felt that he was afraid that he was next going to be called home and then sent to Siberia. And that's what the, the big issue was. And he was a pretty high-ranking um, spy. And so he came to me. And I started, and I realized the information was wrong. And then I just did a regular reading for him. And what the Mounties wanted me to do, though, is, is say in this, um, somewhere in the reading, so I, I, I have a little bit of trouble remembering the exact words, but it was something like, um, sometimes we get in trouble. And sometimes we have friends that we don't know about and then work it into that's that's what I was supposed to say. So I get to the point and I've got his attention and I say those words and he stands up, turns around and walks away and goes, walks right out the door, just walked away. Like just bam, like, didn't say goodbye. Didn't look back, nothing. And um, then the guys come in the room and I said, I, I think I screwed that up. And they said, no, you, you, you didn't. He said, any time the Russians get presented with a suggestion that they would defect, they just get away. They just leave because um, they're always watched. So, so um, that was it. Then a couple of weeks later, um, the uh, the mounted guy now in those days more intelligent during that cold war more intelligence was being passed across the american canadian border at niagara falls than anywhere in the world and the biggest um uh depot for the rcmp security was in niagara falls there also was a cia uh, uh out poster and, and an FBI all watching because all of the the the, the um intelligence so this guy phones me and he says um do you think you could find dead letter boxes dead letter boxes where intelligence is passed and I'd never heard of the dead letter box and I had never even considered that and I said sure and so I went down to Niagara Falls um we look at maps again and I'd look at the maps in the in the in the park and put my hands over it, and we pick them, and then go out and walk around, and and um, I'd find I, I found several. I did that for almost two years, uh, once a month for two years, and and um, found a lot of them. That's awesome. Yeah, great. The parties afterwards are even better. Robert, I noticed you have a YouTube channel. What is the name of it, and what kind of content are you putting up there? Well, um, my my podcast is called My Side of the Crystal Ball, and and I'm talking with people that are in this field and in others, and I'm talking to them um, and getting I get them off topic of of what they usually say, and 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 uh, talk to them 
and 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 they start and I ask them questions that they almost always don't get asked. And each podcast is a really close connection that I have. So it's my side of the crystal ball. You can find it on YouTube, uh, iHeart, Instagram, uh, Apple, Spotify in the UK. Um, UK, uh, now I'm in trouble. Um, UK paranormal, uh, uh, I forgot that one. I have to apologize to them. And then you can find me if you, I, and I'm still doing readings. You can find me on my uh, website or www.robertlindsaymilne.com. Well, I'm going to do the same thing to you because lately my wife and I have been into baking bread and you wow. are an award-winning baker. Yes. So what is your favorite bread to bake? I didn't so much get interested in in, in breads. I, I like um, pies, cakes, tarts, cookies, and things like that. And, and so I didn't do much, uh, much bread baking. Um, and it was many years ago that I got so interested in baking. I've always had um, uh, avocations. And, and when I get interested in something, I become as dedicated to it as I am to being a psychic as well. And, and I got involved and dedicated to baking. Um, at the time, I was a stepfather, and I wanted to learn how to be a good stepfather. And so I first started cooking, baking cookies, mm. and then going to county fairs and winning and winning awards, and and um, and mostly in paste, pastries and 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 cakes. And then I stopped baking for a really long time, and only in the last few months I started again. It's fun. What's the most delicious dessert that you do bake? Oh, I have several. Um, you know, my pies are great. Um, I'm making, uh, tomorrow I'm going to be making um, an Amoretti chocolate tort. And and it's made with um, Amoretti biscuits. And uh, incidentally, I live in Toronto in the area called Corso Italia. And you have to, you, you can buy the biscuits. And, and, uh, I could not find any uh, of the um, Amoretti biscuits, and so I just came back home and looked up a couple of recipes to get the be you know the Amoretti biscuits for the cake, and I and I just learned how to make them instead of getting them from the store. So make my own ingredients now too. Well, I'm gonna throw this out here there. Okay, and I don't expect you to do it, but maybe it's my own prediction that you're gonna start a baking YouTube channel in 2023. You know, that once was an idea about 20 years ago. That's maybe, interesting. Maybe you can share, well, let's share your recipes with us. Be glad to. Robert, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? I end my podcast. Well, my, my thing these days is, is, is being kind. Um, no matter what, be kind. And, and at the end of my podcast, I, I say, do good, stay safe, above all. Just be kind. Thank you for that. And Robert, thanks again for joining me. Don't be a stranger. And I hope to see you next year for the predictions of 2024. Thank you. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.